This is my latest short story that I'm working on called Snakes and Fairies. <clears throat> I have no home. I left where I came from at three years old, and when I returned, I found I was no longer from there, though everyone wanted me to be, especially my parents, maybe to assuage their guilt for not wanting to return themselves. People would ask me what it was like to live over there, overseas, and I would say normal, as that is what it was to me. It was even more normal for me to keep moving, even after my parents settled in the sand. Their home there had been their home there for over 20 years, and they expect me to return for all the holidays, birthdays, and when I am, when I am unwell. Their house welcomes visitors' cars with palm trees bearing sweet dates and the tall gates with Matisse like metal swirls are garland with pink bougainvillea and open to a flame tree and four friendly but noisy dogs. There was always the smell of jasmine. The place we went before where they are now, abandoning the land I was born in in a good riddance pizzazz, had only two seasons and I was always drenched in sweat or settled humidity or from the heavy rain, a season that always made me feel like a witch. And the bugs had a taste for my sweet blood, so my ankles persistently itched, like my feet do now, scabbing and scarring my skin. There was always the smell of the sky sitting on me. When I went back to the country in which I was born to spend the holidays with my grandma, the mosquitoes were just as bad, if not worse. At night time, the horny frogs made so much sound the night was noisy. Her dark wood house was built on stilts raised above the ground to stop it from overheating and avoid problems when the floods came, which they did almost every year. There was always the smell of eucalyptus. One Christmas holiday, when my sister and I were staying with my grandma, we noticed out on the balcony beyond the sliding mosquito screen door, a giant snake. My uncle used to jump off the big brown balcony, the place my grandma hung her laundry out to dry on the washing lines into their pool below. He did this long after his childhood when he was a grown man with long rock star hair and his body covered in tattoos. Fearless, he would leap into the water two levels down below into the backyard. The backyard was always getting swallowed by the surrounding wilderness where they once kept horses. The floor are fiercely and fast encroaching no matter how many times it was pushed back. Once my uncle and me fought against it with shovels and tools and eventually used a bobcat to dig before we build a fence to try and keep it out. Even after that, the precocious and determined natural growth snuck and curled green and tickled through the fence. If someone didn't tend to the pool weekly, it would quickly turn murky and form a moss seal like the neighboring marshes. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, that ends with my grandma. This is fiction, but it ends with my grandma, like I've been in the city for six years now, it ends with my grandma rescuing a cat from like a giant snake that was like bigger than me at six years old. What? <laughs> yeah, she was, she's a... In Queensland, they don't, um, they've got an Australian bartender over there. You should tip. Yes. <laughs> and that she knows about the snakes in Australia, right? <laughs> They're Especially like, the <laughs> Okay, um, this is a short story which is forthcoming in the Columbia, Columbia Literary Review, I believe it is called. Some people have one story that they tell again and again, and when you meet them eight years later, almost a decade, that is still the defining narrative all their friends know, even their new ones. She had the affectation of a swan, and even if she was wearing black, looked like she was dressed in her Sunday whites. Her neck stretched proudly, long, and poised for the halo that would fall down and choke her. Like her mother, she used knowledge for power and indifference for a knife. Being raised amongst the emotionally manipulative and the insecure had done wonders for this swan song. She wanted to talk continuously and about one thing. Like her grandmother who when living had no note and gasping and clinging to life when death approached, unlocked her silent throat. Listen to me, Sylvia, she sang, her crinkled hand clutching her granddaughter's small porcelain hand for cruel but dear life. Some people have the tendency to sweep issues under a rug and not address them. The mess is hidden where it can't be seen and the past piles up. Eventually some people trip over the mountain they made of mere dust turned to mounds under the carpet. Only a tiny bit of Sylvia's grandma, like the tip of an iceberg, was above the surface and an iceberg is cold. 
Gems like frozen water dripped around her body in the hard, impenetrable form of diamonds. One was never to be found unadorned by earrings, bracelets, necklaces, sparkly things and rings. She raised her daughter and granddaughter to always be the decorative element in any room. Harriet, to all who knew her, represented perfect union, balance and life. Sylvia's grandma was always the life of the party, they would say, but Sylvia kept most of herself like her fine jewels locked up in a vault. Harriet and her husband were held up as an example of how a marriage should be and gave all of Sylvia's friends hope. Though divorce can occur, especially following nesting failure, swans tend to mate for life, and Sylvia's grandma was no exception. Harriet and her husband behaved like giddy teenagers till the day she died. They were monogamous when it was, in vo it was vogue in their society to swing. They didn't have affairs. There were no illicit lovers to speak of. This much was true. Harriet and her husband had made friends with fidelity. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. Oops. Oh no, I won't. <laughs> Sorry, I just printed this up. I'm like, I work on a typewriter, but I, everything's electronic these days. I'm like, <laughs> hard copy. Some people hate on what they don't have. Harriet's friends flaunted themselves at her husband, offering him things according to their argument he didn't have. He found everything he ever wanted or needed in Sylvia's grandma, so he would say. Since the very first time he set eyes on her, Harriet's husband would profess he knew he would follow through. Up until the day he had met Harriet, legend has it, he was a cad. Sylvia didn't know that man. She only knew the man who followed her grandma around like a loyal, loving comrade. A man who looked after the ch grandchildren while his queen had her beauty rest in the afternoon, calming their childish qualms with chewy caramels. By the time Sylvia's mother, Marguerite, had come into the world, strutting out like a star, selfish but sparkling. He was a man who took out the garbage, brought his wife breakfast in bed, and always kissed her like they did in the romance movies. Marguerite, his doted upon daughter, would watch with his mother, curled up in silk sheets, the smell of lavender sauntering up their nostrils. Harriet's husband was infatuated, dedicated, treasured his wife above all and anything. But when a swan dies or is killed by a predator, the remaining mate will take up with another, and Sylvia's grandfather was no exception. Some people are succubi, feeding off others in order to shine, a star furiously burning fuel to twinkle, consuming till depleted people in their presence, not caring what stellar gas in their atmosphere they use up until their victim has no energy left and ends up a vacuous black hole. Sylvia was shocked when her grandma, gripping her granddaughter's hand, propped in lacy cream-colored pillows, china cups covered in pink roses, a plate lined with dainty flowers, and coconut vanilla macaroons, piled high on her vanity for deathbed guests to take tea. Dying is no excuse to be a poor hostess. Visitors must be greeted graciously. Said some things one is not accustomed to hearing their grandma say, especially this grandma. Harriet was not known to curse nor be catty, but swans are known to be aggressive, known to aggressively protect their nests. One man was suspected to have drowned in such an attack. As the story sank in, Sylvia stared at a small shrubbery, a bunch of scrambling wild roses, briars, pretty and prickly like Sylvia herself, next to a fragrant thorny Maya tree covered in sharp daggers, its aromatic resin the most exquisite perfume at her grandmother's window. <coughs> Some people shift professions during their lifetime. Harriet's husband began his career in politics at an exceptionally early age before transitioning to finance after he met her. A past Harriet would keep secret from her daughter Marguerite and her granddaughter Sylvia for years, some years to come. The names we smudge as we propel, fast motion a blur to our futures, turning pages as I fill them, like the things we accrue as we set up home, our roots into the ground and objects upon objects. The time one wakes up and finds a palace attached to their house, and the palace is the past. When the past is bigger than the future, and memories come back, weird feelings, an odd deja vu, a recollection we can almost touch but can't, it's just lingering there, intangible and ephemeral, like finding an old deodorant and smelling it, and remember something you can't define. Maraschino cherries attempting class in a non-classy fashion, in vodka mixed drinks, the feeling of cold metal against thighs, the sensation of having a heart that became a hole. Yeah. Do we have a poem now? Poem? Four minutes. Four minutes? Okay. 
And so Linda Kleinbub and I have been sending each other poems. We we did it for like four months, right? Yeah. So we even we're trying to do a poem a day. You're still doing it? Woohoo! I fell off. I fell off. I mean, a bad, bad thought. Um. Okay, here. Oh, I'm a poetry whore, and this is when I'm in the poetry brothel. Um, We're in the club. <laughs> <laughs> so, August 4th, we, Linda and I sent a poem a day back and forth to each other. This is August 4th, 2015. Our Daily Mirror. To think we did all that and not in a shy way. The mother was late, denial, but when she arrived, her and an entourage dressed in black crowded and cuddled at the coffin and her mother fiddled with her daughter's hair and redid her makeup and repositioned the flower a few times before removing it. Her mother asked me who I was. Friend? Friend? I nodded yes, didn't say lover. And um, if you buy this magazine, you got a collage of me with sex toys. <laughs> um, Main to nine. And actually, if you want to submit to this, they're open till the end of um, December or January. End of this month, yeah. Three rooms press, Main to nine ten. Okay, my poem's called Electricity. Electricity does not always mean a connection. What is instant and easy is not always the most satisfying. Sometimes what I need is the moon and my own two hands. Yeah. Yeah. One more. Oh, we got three minutes. Oh, we got three minutes? Okay. Lock it. I'm sorry, guys. You, you were patient with my fiction. <laughs> I wish I had more of the other story, but you even inspired me to write more of it. <laughs> This is Jeffrey Wright, um, magazine Live Mag. Oh, here it is, I found it. And this is To Audrey Lord, The Erotica's Power. And, oh, I work on a typewriter also, and this is my typewriter shape. You have a beautiful voice, sir, by the way. I'm sorry, I don't have that Connecticut drawl. <laughs> <laughs> That's a South Carolina drawl. South Carolina? Oh, okay. To Audrey Lord, um, I was photographed for. Uh, oh, you said no instructions. So, okay. <laughs> to Audrey Lord, the erotic is power. He was a milksop, ineffectual boy in big shoes, and I like big, big men, gorillas, and I like to feel small. Belief systems don't always align with reality. I am mercurial, subject to change of mood or mind, fleeting like a fairy, but you cannot capture me. My light cannot be kept in a jar. I am fleeting and free. An empowered woman is dangerous, but can one be powerful in need? I need someone to take care of me, and I need to start taking care of me. I don't mean money. I mean I want him to tend to domesticity, do my dishes and feed me. I work so hard, my mind on many matters, I forget to eat. I need him to sustain me in the kitchen and always make me calm, know what makes you unhappy and eliminate them one by one. She liked her work, it worked her like she worked herself. With each touch of her clit, she was energized and powerful. Whoa.